Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope you can all understand me all right, coming from up north. <clears throat> so, really the ethical challenges in obstetrics gynaecology is what attracted me to it, really. Um, this thing about having two patients to consider makes it that bit more interesting. One that has a voice, one that doesn't have as obvious a voice, one that has a right to life enshrined in law, and the other not until 24 weeks, unless there's an abnormality. So today I'm going to talk a little bit <clears throat> about moral principles, but I won't spend too much time over that because that has been dealt very well with, with Mike. Talk a little bit about topic pregnancy um, and the different ways of treating ectopic pregnancy, ones ways that are moral, ones that are less moral. Induction of labour, which is what a lot of obstetricians deciding when to induce labour. Management of pre-viable premature rupture of the membranes. A little bit about training in ONG today and just finish it off with re restorative reproductive medicine. So this has already been covered. This has already been covered already, but really there's three things you've got to look at. The what, the why, and the circumstances. And all three have to be working together for it to be morally good. Then there's the principle of double effect, which comes into play very much in obstetrics and gynaecology. It means that sometimes one must perform an action that is in itself morally good, but may also have an unintended ill effect for which the person is not morally culpable. And four things are important with the principle of double effect. The act performed in itself must be morally good or at least indifferent. The good, good effect is directly intended and the bad, bad effect is foreseen but unintended. The good effect is not achieved by means of the bad effect and there is a proportionate reason for causing the harm. And I think the last thing, the proportionate reason is what comes into play And then just looking at the double effect again, really there are three questions to determine whether an action with a double effect is moral or immoral. The question of intention, that one can never intend the evil effect. One's intention must be only for the good effect and the evil must be a regrettable byproduct. The question of causality, that the end does not justify the means. And the third thing, the question of comparable gravity, which is really about proportionality, as I've already mentioned. So first of all, I was going to talk about ectopic pregnancy. So this is a laparoscopy with an ectopic pregnancy in the pulley portion of the left tube, which is where most ectopics land. And there's four ways to treat an ectopic pregnancy. So we've got expectant management. So that's for your patients who are well, that they're usually the HCG level is less than 1500, and you monitor the HCG level and it's fallen by more than 50%. And really what happens is that a tubal abortion occurs and nature really um, takes care of it. And then there's salpingectomy, where you actually remove the entire fallopian tube containing the ectopic pregnancy. Then there's salpingostomy, where the tube is sliced longitudinally and the pregnancy is removed from the tube with forceps or flushed out with hydrodissection. And then there's methotrexate. So looking at topic pregnancy, there's, there's um, a directive, and this is in the US, um, the Ethical and Religious Directive for Catholic Healthcare Services um, in 2018, point 48 says, in cases of extrauterine pregnancy, no intervention is morally illicit, which constitutes a direct abortion. And what is a direct abortion? Well, abortion may be defined as a deliberate killing, however performed, of the early human being, and that's point 0.58 in Evangelium Vitae. So expected management is morally acceptable because we're allowing nature to take its course, if you like. Salpingectomy is also morally acceptable because the surgical action is on the tube and not directly on the fetus, and the the baby dies, obviously, as an indirect consequence, so that is um, due to the, um, is the double effect coverage. So what is methotrexate? Well, methotrexate is used in lots of different 
so autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and it's used in um, ectopic plagues, it's unlicensed. It's a highly toxic drug that interferes with the synthesis of DNA, so any rapidly dividing cells it attacks. And the trophic blast is a rapidly dividing organ, and it's a vital organ to the, the, the fetus. Although it is discarded later on, it must be regarded as an integral part of the body of the unborn child. The trophoblast is exquisitely sensitive to the destructive effect of methotrexate, and that's why it's, it's, it's used for ectopic pregnancy. And there is people on both sides. The, the church hasn't actually came out with saying which one's right, which one's wrong, but there are obviously um, supporters of, some say it's, they're for it and some people are against it. So the people that are for it would say, well, the intention is good because you're trying to preserve the life of the mother. The object is the killing of the trophoblast and not the fetus. And it's the trophoblast that's actually invading the maternal vasculature that's causing the harm to the mother. And some would say that if you, you, you know, you're attacking the trophoblast and not the fetus, which makes it um, morally illicit. But I would say, is the way that we use it in my in our hospital anyway, it's usually is used in pregnancies that are not viable. And I'll just show you um, our protocol. Those that are against it are say. The object is bad, so if that's bad, it's bad because the trophoblast is an intrinsic part of the embryo which has been directly targeted by a biochemical means. So this is our protocol. So patient selection, central criteria is all women must have a transvaginal scan and the uterus must be empty. The agnexal mass, if there is an agnexal mass, must be less than 3.5 centimetres and there shouldn't be any or a very small amount of free fluid. So you're talking about a stable patient who's not, you know, got a lot of free fluid, which would be suggested that she was hemorrhaging. The HCG ideally should be below 5,000. And I'll just show the flow chart. Um, we, it's contraindicated if there's a fetal heart so the bit in green really shows you what happens if the HCG is very low and this is really your sort of expectant management group. It's falling more than 50%, it's a failing pregnancy and we just asked the lady to do a pregnancy test in two weeks' time. Um, if you repeat the HCG in 48 hours, so it's less than 2,000, if you repeat it in 48 hours, if it's rising more than 63%, you'd repeat the scan and either confirms it's a, an intrauterine pregnancy or it's not an intrauterine pregnancy, could eat topics. So the ones that go to the bottom here are the ones that would probably consider using methotrexate. So their ACGs are falling less than 50% or rising less than 63%. So these are pregnancies that are not viable. So in that sense, I feel that it's more than illicit to use methotrexate in, because you're not killing a live fetus. You are preventing the trophoblast from invading the maternal vasculature and that is, and the baby is already, it's, it's already dying, if, at least. Salpingotomy, this was something that was done really when I was a registrar, so we're talking about 20 years ago. Um, it's not something that I've seen practised for the last 20 years. It's when you make a linear incision, just like it's shown there, and you extract the, the trophoblast, and um, often you don't see, you might see, you usually just see sort of placental tissue. Um, you should have done a scan beforehand to make sure that it's not, there's not a live ectopic there. If there's a live ectopic there, then unfortunately you would, have, you, would remove, you would remove the tube so you're not directly attacking. But I can see why most people would be against salpingotomy because you are actually directly, intentionally attacking the fetus. So in that, situ in that situation, I don't think I'd be com I'm comfortable with doing salpingotomy. 
and usually I choose either between the expectant management, salpingectomy, or uh, methotrexate. The thing that we're probably used to doing most of the time is no when to induce labour. Yeah, and it can be complex. Two patients involved in each decision, the mother and the baby in neutral, and you're really balancing up the interest of the mother and the fetus. <clears throat> and it really is, the key thing is the gestational age. You're trying to prolong the pregnancy until the baby is better out than in, usually. And you're monitoring the effect of the maternal disease on the baby and the effect of the pregnancy on the maternal condition. So there's a real interplay between the two. And usually you're, you're saying, well, I'm to, I need to induce labour because of the benefits of the baby or I'm inducing labour because of the benefits to the mother or it could be for both that you're doing this. An example of inducing labour for the baby alone would be their um, rhesus disease or um, a baby who's um, diabetic or small for gestational age where you're deciding that the baby is better out than in. And in rhesus disease, where you're monitoring the blood flow, you're, you're looking for um, anemia and they measure the sort of Doppler in the mid cerebral artery in the baby's brain, and that can tell them when that the baby is at risk of um, severe anemia, which can cause hydrox, which is heart failure. And you're deciding whether should we transfuse the baby or is the baby at gestation where we can deliver it safely and it'll survive. So there's usually no sort of um, ethical issues there. Preeclampsia, as you know, is one of the most common conditions we'll deal with. Um, in severe preeclampsia, the mother is at risk of eclampsia, so fitting, intracerebral haemorrhage, having a stroke, developing HELP syndrome, which can lead to DIC and liver rupture. The fetus is also at risk um, in preeclampsia is at risk of the effects of the maternal hypertension on placental function. The baby can be small, it can develop, it can, there can be an abruption. There's a small risk of induction in the mother. Um, obviously, if somebody's going for induction, it's a lot, much longer process than spontaneous labour. She can, and the, the rate limiting step is usually getting from being able to break the waters to actually getting them into the labour ward, usually due to uh, lack of midwifery staff. There's also an increased risk of cesarean section after induction labour compared to spontaneous labour. The risk of induction in the fetus depends on the gestational age with risk of prematurity versus the risk of intrauterine death as a, as a result of the disease. <coughs> you, what you're normally <coughs> doing with preeclampsia is you're trying to get into gestation, you're trying to control the mother's blood pressure to protect the mother until you can prolong the pregnancy to 37 weeks and then go ahead and induce. Because the only cure is really to deliver the placenta. This is a case of a 30-year-old primogabita and she presented at 23 weeks and she'd fitted at home twice. When she came in, she was, her, her blood pressure was 108 over 110, she had 4 plus the proteinuria, so the diagnosis was obvious that this was eclampsia. The fetal heart was positive. Now she'd had a scan three weeks earlier, her fetal anomaly scan, and the baby was tiny. So this baby had severe IUGR on her fetal anomaly scan. So when she came in, we gave her magnesium sulfate, a loading dose, and put her on a, a mag sulfate infusion to reduce the risk of her having a fit, and gave her intravenous labetalol to bring her blood pressure down to protect her brain, and we gave steroids to mature the baby's lungs. But it took quite a, it was difficult to get in and control the mother's blood pressure, and then she had another fit. Now this baby is 23 weeks, it's a tiny baby. We're thinking, do we, do we transfer this mother out? But with someone who's had three fits, that wouldn't be safe. It wouldn't be safe. So the decision was taken to <coughs> induce labour. So this is an example of double effect. We're not, we're having to induce labour because we want to protect the life of the mother and the unintended but foreseen consequence of that is that the baby is likely to die because of the gestation and also that the baby is, um, is poor prognosis being so small. And in these cases, we have to sign a medical termina a termination form and it always kind of makes you feel because in my mind, I'm thinking a termination means you're willfully wanting to end the baby's life, whereas in this situation, you're not. But the law is if you are 
inducing labour, under 24 weeks, you have to sign a, the green form. And, but you're consoled with the fact that you know your intention is not to kill the baby. So you have to go ahead with this because that's what the law says. Um, there's also a consent form for the mother and I would put on the consent form that we're inducing labour. I wouldn't put on the consent form that we're terminating your pregnancy. Um, and I think language is very important in these situations. So it would be 1C that the continuation of the pregnancy would involve risk to life of the pregnant woman greater than if the pregnancy were terminated. So you're probably all aware of the Savita Halepanavar um, case. And this is a case that really did sow confusion. I was in Galway at this time when this happened. It was in 2012. And I remember I was on my way to work at about seven in the morning when this, you know, news came over that someone had died, a woman had died of a miscarriage. And it really does sort of choke you when you hear that. And, and, and in this unit, there hadn't been a death for 16 years, a direct maternal death. So this was a huge deal. I'll just remind you of the background to the, the case. She was a 31-year-old dentist in her first pregnancy. Um, she'd herself referred to the gynaecology ward, accompanied by her husband at 17 weeks of pregnancy, and she had low backache, and they thought she had a urine infection, and she was sent away. And she came back a few hours later, saying that she felt something had dropped. And she was examined, and there was bulging membranes, and they couldn't feel any cervix. So that makes you think the cervix is so dilated that you can't feel it. So the diagnosis at that point was inevitable miscarriage. Um, she was admitted to the hospital. Um, and later that evening, about half past 12, her waters broke. Her bloods were done at the time, but I don't think they really chased up. But her white cell count was 17, so that was raised. And she was expecting to miscarry. And the next morning, she said, well, why well, don't, you know, I'm in a lot of pain here. And she did ask for a termination. And it was said to her, you can't, we, we're in Ireland, you know, our law doesn't allow this. And they kept listening to the fetal heart and the focus became, we have to wait till this baby dies before we can induce labor. That seemed to be what people were focusing on. She was started on erythromycin, which is a sort of thing that we do for anyone with T-term rupture of the membranes. Um, unfortunately, so she got admitted on the Sunday by the early hours of the Wednesday morning. She was in a bad way. Um, she, her temperature was 39, her pulse was 160. And still, it seemed to be that people were thinking, we have to wait till this baby dies. And nobody was really making a diagnosis. And the sort of pro-abortion movement grabbed this case and ran with it. And it went viral and it was everywhere. And people were out campaigning before there was any sort of proper investigation to the cause of the death. And when they did do an investigation, this was on the death certificate. So a post-mortem examination performed on the 30th of October 2012. The cause of death was fulminant septic shock from E. coli bacteremia due to ascending genital tract sepsis, miscarriage at 17 weeks associated with chorionitis. <coughs> and when they looked at it in detail, they showed that really nobody had sort of, she wasn't getting um, her observations done as regularly as she should have been. And nobody was making any sort of diagnosis about what the cause of this and of her being unwell was. It wasn't until, you know, the Wednesday that actually the word sepsis came up. And it was when they brought her down to put a central line in that um, she aborted the baby herself. So there was a whole load of factors, but really it was lack of recognition of the seriousness of her condition, lack of prompt intravenous antibiotics, um, not adhering to clinical guidelines, 
um, the, not using the MU score. Now, there's a thing called the MU score. You're probably aware of the new score, which is National Early Warning. So you've got the maternity early warning system as well. And although it was around, it wasn't something that was in common practice in Ireland at that stage. And this was just, you probably can't read that, but really that just what I'd said already, that they looked at all the different factors and it really was infection, lack of diagnosis, lack of prompt management um, that caused her death rather than the fact that termination of pregnancy was not available. This is the, the recent Embrace report. So that's um, the maternity. Um, this is done every three years, looking at all the maternal deaths in the previous three years, and they're trying to learn lessons from them so that these lessons are spread. So this is an excellent um, piece of work that's done every three years. And this was a woman who died after preterm pre labor rupture of the membranes. There were two women in the last three years who died in the UK of, of this. This woman was, she had a, um, assisted reproduction. She ruptured her membranes at 22 weeks. After delay in review, she was transferred to a tertiary unit with a neonatal intensive care facility. Upon arrival, the risks to the baby with premature birth were discussed extensively with her, but the risks to her of a serious infection were not discussed. She opted to delay birth. More than two days after her membranes ruptured, she developed signs of sepsis. The consultant was informed, but it was three hours before she was reviewed. Her white cell count was raised, which was attributed to given steroids. She, these had to be steroids to mature the baby's lungs. Minutes later, she had a temperature of 39 and a mu score of 5. She was transferred to the labour ward where the sepsis pathway was started, but delivery was not expedited. A few hours later, she had a spontaneous vaginal birth. Her condition continued to deteriorate. She died less than 12 hours after her symptoms of infection started. And the point that they make here is that there was about, is about the counselling of the woman. And I think if this woman had been counselled properly and explained to her that the balance had tipped, that she, her life is in danger, she has severe chorioaminitis, the baby won't survive this either. So prolonging the pregnancy was not going to benefit either of them. And the right thing to do was to induce labour. This was a study um, I came across in the British Journal of Ops and Gynae. It was in 2012, and it was two different centres in Paris, and centre A and centre B. And centre A was a, was a centre where abortion, there was, shall we say, it was a more pro-life sort of attitude there, and centre B was more pro-abortion. And they looked at, over a sort of four-year period, of all women who had ruptured membranes between 18 weeks and about 20, and 24 weeks. And the outcomes were that in centre eight, there was 29 patients that continued with the pregnancy and 28 in centre B. The gestational age at delivery in centre A was 28 weeks compared to 25 weeks in centre B. The latency, which is the time from the ruptured membranes to actually delivering the baby, was 45 days in centre A and only 16 days in centre B. And um, the outcomes were slightly better, although that wasn't significant. There was 82% live-born babies in centre A compared to 71% in centre B with conservative management. And when you looked at how they managed these women, there were slight differences. So they all got ampicillin for five or seven days when they first presented. Then if they had subclinical chorioaminitis, so a bit like my patient when she had this slight rise in CRP and the white cell count, they would give them in centre A triple antibiotics for 48 hours. So they'd give them it's probably gentamicin, a third generation cephalosporin and, and an antifungal. Whereas in the other centre, they just gave them a single dose of an intravenous antibiotic. And also, two thirds of the babies were delivered by cesarean section in centre A, 
compared to one out of three in centre B. So there was, they were much more actively managed in the pro-life centre, shall we say. So you can see how the sort of pro-life sort of attitude really can affect the outcomes and how you manage um, these pregnancies, which can make a difference to the outcome. So I was looking at um, coming back to training in obstetrics and gynaecology, and I was pleased to see that they've got these things called SIPs, and it's called capability in practice. And this one at the bottom is, says that doctors should be aware of ethical principles. And I'm not sure how much ethical training actually goes on, but understands ethical principles and how these underpin practice and acts professionally in difficult ethical situations. Another thing I want to highlight here is um, pr promotes non-discriminatory practice. So discrimination, you're allowed to discriminate, you're not allowed to discriminate against a patient, as Mike was saying earlier on, but you're allowed to So I don't want to do prescribe contraception, for example, um, or I don't want to um, be involved in IVF, or you can say I don't want to do sterilisations. And when it comes to sterilisation, in our hospital, sterilisations are only done at the time of caesarean section if they're planned electively. And if the woman was to come in and have an emergency caesarean section, we don't do sterilisations and the patients are told that. So that does make life a little bit easier for people coming through the profession who don't want to do sterilisations. If they're on for the elective list, they can see what's on it. If there's a sterilisation on it, they can say, OK, I'm not going to take part in that list. And they would swap out and and the registrar would do a list and, and they'd go and do a clinic or do something else. Um, this is the matrix for the seven years of training for um, in obstetrics and gynaecology. And by year two, they have to have done an evacuation of the uterus, but that can be an evacuation of the uterus for a miscarriage, which is appropriate management and doesn't cause any ethical, ethical issues and they have to have inserted a coil. So some people have had issues with this. Um, they have to have fitted three coils and one of them should be um, supervised by a consultant. But often you can use the marina coil and particularly in postmenopausal patients who are using it as part of their HRT or you can be fitting a coil for somebody with heavy periods and they're sterilised or their husband's had a vasectomy. In those situations, you're not primarily using it as a, as a method of contraception. So there are ways around um, the matrix. Facts. Now, this is, I'm looking at the restorative. If you're, you know, there is so much out there now that we are actually being able to give patients better care than contraception. In the vast majority of patients, it doesn't matter. It's like the patient comes with heavy bleeding, she comes with painful periods, she comes with polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's like the pill's given for everything. And the pill is not actually addressing the underlying problem. It's a bit like a Band-Aid, you know? So there's a lady called Marguerite Duane, and she is a general practitioner in America, and she has set up FACTS. Now, FACTS stands for Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to teach the science. And her big thing is to try and get into medical schools teaching on natural family planning, fertility awareness methods. And she has a four-week elective, which people do online. Um, I teach on, um, I lecture on it, um, and you can, it's very easy to do, but you can, you can join FACTS about fertility and, you can get, you get lots of emails giving you information about all the different methods of family planning and how you can train in them. Um, and medical students, as I say, can do a four-week four elective. They can do it during their holidays. If, and it would be lovely to have something like that here, actually. This is um, NAPA technology. I worked with Phil Boyle in Galway, and this was a paper that was published of his first four years practice, so it's a long time ago, and he's doing a lot more now than it was then. But when you looked at his practice from 1998 to 2002, 
showed that for women who follow NAPRO technology, so this was quite a difficult group of women, their, their average age was 36 years, they've been trying to get conceived for six years. One in four had a, a prior birth and one in three had tried IVF. The cumulative live birth rate for those completing, completing up to two years of NAPRO technology was 52.8% per 100 couples, so 52.8 of them had a live baby at the end of the two years, and that compares very favourably with um, IVF. This is also um, talking about NAPO technology as an alternative, but a much better alternative for, for doctors who, doctors and healthcare professionals who are Catholic, are Christian and do oppose um, contraception and IVF. This is uh, Phil Boyle has now set up new fertility in Galway, and it's similar to Napa technology. It's got a really good online platform, and I'm doing a little bit of new new fertility Napa technology um, in my practice at the moment. One thing I would really recommend is joining APLOG, which is the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Um, Dermot and I went out to their conference in February this year. It was absolutely brilliant. There are streaks ahead of us. You learn so much. You can see um, pro-life obstetrics and gynae in all fields of... They're, they're, they're doing fetal maternal medicine. Um, and they are... And they're, they're also in labour ward medicine. And it's really refreshing to see, you know, that Christians can get into this field. So how would I summarise how to succeed as a pro-life um, healthcare professional in Ops and Gynae? So anticipate the difficulties and think of solutions. Be part of the solutions, really. It's obviously got to be a hard-working, reliable healthcare professional and a good colleague. Join the CMA. <laughs> Go to understand the principles of good moral decisions so that you can actually defend your position and actually may make other people think. People do admire people who stand up for things and always do it with charity and gentleness. And learn about fertility, learn about the, the good alternatives, better alternatives to contraception really. Um, learn about the Billings Method, fantastic, great science behind it. Um, and all the restorative approaches to fertility and women's health that really can make a difference to women's lives. So we have to be careful. Remember, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, so be cunning as servants and yet as harmless as doves. So we're not out there looking for trouble. And I thought this was a great quote. The truth is like a line. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. It will defend itself. So I would strongly encourage people to take that leap and don't be afraid of coming into obstetrics and gynaecology and being pro-life. I think the more of you we have, the better. Thanks very much.